In this third part of our tutorial on lower motor neuronal control of movement, I'd like to talk about central pattern generation. Our learning objective is simply to describe central pattern generators and their significance for locomotion and other forms of rhythmic behavior. Well, let's talk about locomotion as one example of a basic pattern that is essential for movement that requires the coordination of the activity of flexor muscles and extensor muscles in our limbs and even across the midline of the spinal cord. Now for a quadrupedal animal like a cat, this involves coordinating flexors and extensors in the hind limbs as well as the forward limbs. In bipedal locomotion, which is what we do, uh, we see something quite similar. There's coordination of flexor extensors in our weight-bearing muscles um, in our lower extremities, but there's also coordination of swing cycles with respect to what we're doing with our arms in our upper extremities. So uh, coordination is happening across the midline. It's happening uh, within the motor columns that are supplying flexor and extensor muscles right next to each other in the same ventral horn. And there's also coordination that's happening across spinal cord segments. So how is this possible? Well, when we just consider the flexion extension reflexes that are seen when we encounter a potentially harmful stimulus like stepping on a tack, we saw how local circuits can coordinate the activities of flexors and extensors. And local circuits can even span the midline so that what's going on on the opposite ventral horn can be synergistic with the behavioral goal. Well, something like that is what we see in the generation of rhythmical movement, rhythmical pattern. And this has been studied um, for locomotion in mammals, but it's been really worked out quite well in invertebrate systems and in very primitive kinds of uh, vertebrate animals. Uh, one such model system that has been very productive in the study of central pattern generation has been the study of swimming behavior in a very primitive kind of vertebrate called the lamprey. Well, the lamprey is a swimming creature that swims through the coordination of uh, a set of segmental muscles. And we now know that the output to those muscles uh, is derived, of course, from alpha motor neurons that uh, send their axons out through ventral roots. But the output of these alpha motor neurons is coordinated through a set of interneurons, some of which are excitatory, some of which inhibitory, and some of which are responsible for generating the essential rhythms that define the swimming behavior. Now studies of these fairly simple central pattern generators that we see in animals like the lamprey or in other kinds of uh, simple model systems that generate rhythmical behaviors. Um, what we find is that central pattern generators tend to have the same kinds of elements, uh, no matter what the model system is that we happen to be looking at. Of course, there are variations on these themes, but we tend to recognize the same kinds of elements that are common to all circuits that generate patterns. One common element is the presence of pacemaker neurons. Some of these neurons will generate the rhythms that define the behavior. And these rhythms reflect the activities in uh, oscillations of membrane potential, in bursts of action potentials, that are generated uh, by this set of pacemaker neurons. Uh, central pattern generators typically involve an interaction between uh, excitatory neurons and inhibitory neurons. Some of these neurons are going to send connections that cross the midline, and this allows for the coordination of circuitry in one ventral horn with that of another. There will also be circuitry that spans the segmental levels, allowing for the interactions from one segment to another. Another common element that we see in central pattern generation is modulation from descending inputs. For vertebrates, this comes in the form of descending inputs from the brainstem. And this allows the expression of pacemaker activity uh, to actually be initiated by these descending inputs. Often these inputs release biogenic amine neurotransmitters. And these biogenic amines uh, can often set the rhythm in motion, or they can modulate the rate of the rhythm. 
There's also input to these pacemaker circuits that come from sensory signals that are derived from our sensory receptors are conveyed via the dorsal roots into the spinal cord circuitry. Uh, but these sensory signals often are not essential, so it's possible to remove these sensory signals and still see the expression of this essential rhythm generated by this circuit. And one final feature that I'll mention of central pattern generators is that they can actually generate uh, different kinds of movement patterns. Consider, for example, the difference between a walk and a jog and a run and a sprint. Uh, this is not simply just a matter of the rate of output, but there's actually a different pattern that can be produced. This is especially true in quadrupedal animals, where there's a transition from an alternation of uh, activities in the limbs between forelimbs and hind limb to a coordination that is concurrent with the transition from a trot to a gallop. So something like that uh, must occur in our central pattern generators as well as we transition from one kind of pace to another. So the very same circuit can generate more than one pattern. Although the activity of these central pattern generators can be modulated via descending inputs, uh, the pattern itself can still be expressed even in the absence of the, these descending inputs. And this point was made uh, rather dramatically some decades ago in experiments done on cats uh, that uh, were subject to transection of the spinal cord. So in the experiments illustrated here, uh, what was discovered is that with a thoracic transection of the spinal cord, it was still possible to suspend this cat on a treadmill and record the rhythmical activities of extensors and flexor muscles that were consistent with locomotion as the hind limbs transitioned between the stance phase where uh, pressure is applied to the treadmill and the swing phase as the limb is removed from the treadmill and then swung forward for the next cycle of step. This basic rhythm of stance and swing with the activation of flexor muscles and extensor muscles was seen even after the dorsal roots were sectioned, suggesting that this is a pattern that is intrinsic to the circuitry of the ventral horn of the spinal cord, even though typically it's informed by sensory signals coming in through the dorsal roots and it's modulated and initiated via descending inputs from the brainstem. Now, as you might imagine, there's been considerable interest in whether this kind of treadmill training uh, for human beings who've suffered either spinal cord injury or brain injury uh, can be um, clinically significant for walking recovery. Uh, well, there is ongoing effort to try to study this question. So the upshot seems to be that, at least for walking behavior in people, that our spinal cord seem to be more dependent upon the descending controls for coordinating and facilitating the activation of our central pattern generators than in some of the other animal models that uh, have been explored. Well, we come now to the last part of this tutorial where we consider the clinical picture of individuals that have suffered damage to their lower motor neurons. So I'll see you in just a moment and we'll consider the lower motor neuron syndrome.